All right. Well, I've already told you what the, um, the theme is uh, this morning. Let me just read a, a short passage of Scripture where our Lord Jesus <clears throat> basically is uh, predicting, he's prophesying, that um, Peter is going to deny him. We've already read about the denial, but um, again, this is just uh, the initial part of the text we've already read. So, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded permission to sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when once you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. But he said to him, Lord, with you I am ready to go both to prison and to death. And he said, I say to you, Peter, the rooster will not crow today until you have denied three times that you know me. I want you to notice again, Satan demanded permission to sift him like wheat. Jesus didn't say, but I didn't give him that permission. No, but rather, permission has been granted him, okay? But Jesus is saying, I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. So we do need to recognize that Satan is sometimes given that permission, but Jesus is praying for us so that our faith would not fail. But again, that doesn't mean that there's nothing we are to do. Uh, we need to be pursuing the Lord. We also need to be repelling the enemy, and that's what this uh, series is really all about, recognizing his strategies and knowing how to fight him. So we've noted in this series thus far that the main weapon the devil uses against us is deception. Now, some of you are familiar with Dr. John Gerstner. You know, I think uh, he's the one that, that really uh, got me interested in Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards is the one who kind of nourished Gerstner's understanding of a number of areas of theology. But I think we understand that Gerstner also nurtured R.C. Sproul his understanding. Uh, he was one of R.C. Sproul's seminary professors. He eventually became um, his mentor and later, as you know, a teacher at, at Ligonier. Well, <clears throat> he wrote a three-volume work on uh, the, what's called the rational biblical theology of Jonathan Edwards. And he asked this question, how does the devil go about his devilish ways? And he answers in this way. He blinds and deceives. The very darkness of this world comes from the darkness of the bottomless pit. Now, the way that he blinds and deceives is by implanting ideas in our minds. So he says this, he suggests thoughts such as casting oneself from the temple, taking the senses, betraying Christ, as well as forwarding men's natural lusts. And then the question arises, well, how does he do that? How does he implant these ideas in the mind? And he, he answers in this way. How all this is done cannot be certainly determined. But Edwards makes a number of suggestions. And really, here's two from Edwards. First, by working on the humors of the body. Now, that, that's kind of a strange show. Uh, uh, statement. Uh, I don't pretend to know exactly what that means, but I did look it up. And in the 18th century, there was a belief that our temperament was uh, controlled by four fluids in the body. And I don't know what those four are necessarily or how they affect us, but anyway, what he meant by this is he works on our temperament. Perhaps if we're melancholy, tries to get us to fall into a greater state of depression or for prideful or whatever it might be. So he works on the humors of the body. And secondly, by making impressions on the imagination of the pleasures of sin and the like, or wrong impressions of the injury they will receive in the service of virtue, etc. Now, what Edwards basically summarizes in those couple of statements, Brooks has been unpacking for us, but I want you to see this one part, that the devil has the ability to affect us. He has the ability to introduce ideas. He can work on our imaginations. And I know that we all know that, okay? Because if we're Christians, we've experienced that. The devil is trying to get us to think about things we shouldn't be thinking about. And he's trying to... You know, stir up those sinful affections in us to go after those things. Well, 
these impressions on our imaginations, that I think is what Brooks is talking about. And he, we've already seen a couple of them. He shows us how much fun sin's going to be, but he hides the consequences. Or he makes sin look like something good, something virtuous, so that we'll want to do it. And then last week we looked at the fact that Satan also tries to minimize sin, to convince us that, that God doesn't really care about it, that God laughs at those things. You know, he's not concerned about that because Satan knows that if he can get us to fall to what we think of as lesser sins, that this will offend God even more. Remember how uh, Brooks argued that if we're, you know, smaller sins bring smaller temptations. And if we're willing to betray God for a small temptation, then what does that say about our love for God? Okay. Satan wants us to fall to the smaller sins, of course, remembering there is no such thing as a small sin because every sin that we commit is against an infinitely holy and worthy God. And every sin we commit deserves infinite punishment. But the point is, again, broad, broadly, Satan tries to get us to look at sin as something other than what it is so that he might more easily get us to stumble. Again, if you have children that are not walking with the Lord, if you know people who may have been in a church once but are no longer, it's because Satan has been successful in getting them to look at the things that really are good as bad and the things that really are bad is good. I mean, just look at the society around us and see the direction it's going. Okay, and I think we all know by now that from not only from the things we see in others, but the things we see in ourselves, that Satan is very good at what he does. And so we need to be aware and we need to be ready. So this morning, we're going to look at another deception. And I've already mentioned what that is. He shows us that others have sinned, okay? Even the very best of saints. I mean, if you're thinking about heroes of the faith, you know, David, Peter, we know they were very godly men, but yet they also sinned terribly, okay? But they sinned, and yet they came out okay. So Satan wants to use that to encourage us. Now, first of all, let's look at Peter's example. We've already read how when Jesus was on trial for his life, Peter was in the outer courtyard while, you know, warming himself by the fire, while some bystanders were confronting, you know, Peter and asking him whether or not he was one of Jesus' disciples. And he ended up denying three times that he even knew him. The third time, even though we didn't read this in Luke, I believe it's in Mark's gospel, he, he swore the third time. And sometimes I think we think he was cursing. You know, um, you know, he started using foul language. That, that way they wouldn't look at him. He can't, can't be a follower of Jesus if you're using dirty language. But that's not what he did. What he did was he called down a curse upon himself, swearing that he did not know him. If I know him, may God strike me down. Something uh, to that effect. Okay. Now, Peter did all of that. And that, it's been pointed out in front of a servant girl, I think on one or two occasions, and then some other bystander. And yet, Jesus forgave him. And he went on to become a leader in the church. Now, if Peter can do that, okay, why can't we? Now, Brooks is asking us the question here, whether or not we have ever used this passage to excuse ourselves for denying Christ, okay? Or for remaining silent, uh, blending in with, with the crowd, uh, being ashamed of Jesus, perhaps even being fearful of what people might do if they happen to know that we're a Christian, when we should have taken a stand. I mean, what should Peter have done in that courtyard? He should have said, yes, I am one of them, and you need to repent and believe on, on Jesus, right? Uh, he needed to take a stand and not to be afraid, but have we, again, done the same thing as Peter? Now, we've all likely been in situations like this where we should have taken a stand and we failed to do what we should have done. We failed to say what needs to be said. And we know that even though that has happened, okay, the Lord forgives us when we confess our sins and turn from our sins. But again, the question is, are we using Peter's example to justify our failure? Okay, that is not... 
why the Lord put that account in the Bible. Okay, that's what Brooks wants to remind us of. Now, what about the other examples we see in Scripture? David's adultery with Bathsheba, Solomon's hedonism, Samson's lack of self-control, Noah's drunkenness. Okay, have we used those sins in the same way? Now, if we have, Satan has succeeded in deceiving us. Okay, he wants us to see these bad examples. And he wants to encourage us to do the same thing and not to worry about failing, again, for that very reason. Because they sinned, but they made it out okay. Now, Brooks continues, not only does Satan not want us to see, uh, basically, um, not only does Satan want us to see the bad example and use that as an example, right? But he also doesn't want us to see the good examples that they give to us so that we won't be encouraged to godliness. Okay, if we look at Peter and we just see his denial, I think sometimes we think of Peter as the, you know, the disciple that didn't deny Jesus. But we miss everything else about his life. By the way, Peter also failed after Pentecost, didn't he? When he became somewhat hypocritical uh, when the Jews came. Um, I believe it was in Antioch. And Peter was spending time with the Gentiles until they came. But afterwards, uh, when the Jews came from Jerusalem, he began to withdraw from them. And Paul withstands him to his face and basically calls him hypocritical. Okay? Because it was. It was sin. Okay, again, we don't want to just focus on those two things. We don't want to miss what else was true about Peter, and that is his constant devotion to the Lord. If we don't see that, then again, Satan has deceived us. Okay, Peter, what, what, what else do we know about Peter? He left everything for Christ. He left his wife and his family. He was a married man. He had a mother-in-law, right? But he left his wife and his family, at least for a time, even his vocation in order to follow Jesus during his earthly ministry, and that not without some measure of suffering. And then after Jesus died and rose again from the dead and the Spirit descends on Pentecost, he gave the rest of his life to preach and proclaim the kingdom of God at the constant risk of his life and through a great amount of suffering. You know, we know that, that he was in prison one time and actually was probably slated to be put to death. And eventually he did give his life for the gospel. Church tradition tells us that he was eventually crucified upside down. He didn't want to be crucified like his Lord, right side up, because he didn't consider himself worthy to die in the same way that his Lord had died. Well, in the same way, Satan wants us to remember David's adultery and David's murder, but to forget that he was a man after God's own heart who loved him and trusted him and did great things for him throughout his life. He wants us to sin like Peter and David, but not to live for God's glory as they did. And then finally, the devil also doesn't want us to see the consequences of those sins. Brooks says the tears, the sighs, the groanings, the meltings, the humblings, and repentings of these precious souls. You know, Satan basically says, look, you know, again, he sinned, he made it out okay, and there really wasn't a downside to it, if you missed that part. If, if he can convince us of that, it'll be easier for him to get us to fall into sin. So now the question is, and, and this is the most important part, what does Brooks give to us? What counsel does he give us to help us escape this deception? Well, first of all, he points out that the Holy Spirit was just as careful to record the saints' repentance as he was their falling into sin. Okay? David committed adultery and murder, but he also turned away from those sins. He writes in Psalm 32, verse 5, I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. He also writes in Psalm 51, Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions. 
and my sin is ever before me. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. I think you understand that word blood guiltiness means being guilty of the blood or the death or the murder of some other person. So he's pleading for God to forgive him here of murder, okay? David sinned, but he repented. Uh, Peter denied the Lord, but he also repented. Remember that we read in Luke 22, 61 and 62, that when he denied him the third time, the Lord turned. Apparently, that inner room Jesus was in had an open window, and Jesus could see Peter in the courtyard from there. The Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had told him, before a rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. I think it's interesting that... Um, Jesus was engaged with what was going on inside, and yet he knew the, th the third time Peter had denied him on the outside, though it's certain he could not have heard him, right? But he knew it, and he looked at Peter at that very moment, and Peter realized what he had done, and he wept bitterly. Clement of Rome, who lived, uh, I think his life perhaps overlapped that of Peter, wrote this, that Peter so repented that all his life after, every night when he heard the cock crow, he would fall upon his knees and weeping bitterly would beg pardon of his sin. Now, you know, when we do confess our sins and ask for the Lord's forgiveness, we turn from our sins, God does forgive us, but the shame of that sin follows us for the rest of our lives. And we remember those things, and the Lord wants us to remember them, to humble us, not to shame us, but to humble us, and Peter was definitely humbled over what he had done. Brooks writes this, Ah, souls, you can easily sin as the saints, but can you repent with the saints? Many can sin with David and Peter that cannot repent with David and Peter, and so must perish forever. Now, he reminds us here that if we sin and we don't repent, then we really don't know the Lord, okay? So, we must also repent, okay? There is, there is the committing of the sin, but remember there is also in a true saint the repenting of the sin. Now, that, this second point follows. Second, saints do not continue in sin, okay? They do repent, but the point is here that the pattern of their lives, the practice of their lives is not sin, but it's righteousness, okay? So sin is not the pattern, they resist it, he says, and only occasionally fell into sin. I've already read for you what John writes in 1 John 3, verse 9. No one who is born of God practices sin. And what he means by that is not that they don't sin, and not that they don't sin frequently, and not that they don't fall into the same sin even many times in a day. But what he means by that is no one who is born of God actually gives himself without resistance to sin, practices it lustily, so to speak. Okay, Brooks writes this, the saints cannot sin with a whole will, but as it were with a half will, an unwillingness, not with a full consent, but with a dissenting consent. Augustine writes this, that, that uh, though there is sin in the regenerate, yet it does not reign over them. They rise by repentance, okay? When we fall into sin, you know, we will fall into it, but we will not do it without some measure of resistance, okay? And then, of course, as we've seen in the first point, we will repent of it. Now, thirdly, Though God doesn't put us out of the family for, his, for our sins, that is, out of the, He doesn't disown us. He doesn't, um, you know, He's adopted us through Christ. He doesn't now then just throw us out as orphans again. Even though He doesn't do that, He does discipline us. Sometimes He disciplines us severely. Now, again, remember the sin that David committed it was pretty serious, you know, uh, adultery and murder. David writes this in Psalm 51, verse 8, Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken 
rejoice. You see, God's discipline to David felt like he was breaking his bones. It was not a light and easy thing. And I think you understand, too, that his sins not only had consequences on his subjective feeling of his relationship with the Lord, but it also had consequences on his house. Nathan says to him in 2 Samuel 12, verses 10 through 12, Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you from your own household. I will even take your wives before your eyes and give them to your companion. And he shall lie with your wives in broad daylight. Indeed, you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and under the sun. By the way, when um, David repented, his sins were forgiven. But do you know that the Lord still did this to him? Uh, There were sons that fought against the other sons. Uh, Absalom was killed, not Absalom, but Amnon was killed by Absalom. And Absalom, in order to make himself odious to David and to show Israel that he had distanced himself from his father, took some of his father's wives and put them in a tent and went into them in broad daylight. He, He fulfilled this passage. So there are serious consequences for sin. The author to the Hebrews tells us that God chastens his own people. Chapter 12, verses 7 through 8, it is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. You see, God chastens us because he loves us. The reason why he chastened David was because he loved David. The same thing with Peter. Brooks writes this, though God will not utterly take from them his loving kindness, nor suffer his faithfulness to fail, nor break his covenant, nor alter the thing that has gone out of his mouth, yet he will visit their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. The scripture abounds with instances of this kind. Finally, Brooks reminds us of this, that um, there are really two reasons why the Lord recorded the sins of his saints, and it was not to encourage them to sin, okay? First, it was to keep us from despairing when we do fall into sin. It's comforting to see the recovery of the saints and to know that's possible. You know, there are those who as you probably know, fall into sin, uh, another deception of the enemy is to uh, point to that passage where Esau, remember, sold his birthright for a bowl of stew, and he sought for repentance. He wanted the blessing back, but he couldn't get it back, even though he sought with it, for it with tears. And Satan will point to that passage and say, you know what? You've sinned against the Lord. He's, he's done with you. You know, you, even though you're gonna, you weep over your sins, he's not going to take you back. Well, the Lord has included these passages uh, of the, the recovery of the saints to remind us that, yes, he does forgive. But the second reason he put it in the scripture is this, to keep us from sinning in the first place, okay? Not to encourage us to sin, but to encourage us not to sin. Brooks, Brooks writes this, there is nothing in the world that can so notoriously cross the grand end of God's recording of the sins of his saints than for any from that to take encouragement to sin. That is not why the Lord put these passages in here. Now, that's what Satan wants to do. He wants us to use these passages to excuse our sin, but God gave them for just the opposite reason. Now, Bernard of Clairvaux once wrote this, I have known a good man who, when he heard of any that had committed some notorious sin, he would say with himself, he fell today, so may I tomorrow. Now, what Bernard of Clairvaux is expressing here is exactly what God wants us to take from this passage. David sinned, so might I. Peter denied the Lord. I might do the same thing. And to be afraid of doing that, not to be encouraged. So God gives these as warnings not as encouragements. So to summarize what we've seen this morning, 
When the devil tries to convince us that we may sin and not be concerned, because even the greatest saints have sinned and they've recovered, we need to remember that they did not continue in sin, okay? They didn't practice sin. They, they practiced righteousness. That when they fell into sin, they repented. That even though God didn't put them out of the family, He still disciplined them severely. And that God put these accounts in His Word not to encourage us to sin, but not to sin, but also to show us that there is hope when we do fall into sin. So we need, again, to be aware that Satan works in these ways, and we need to know how to resist him when he comes. So may the Lord help us to remember some of the things that we've looked at this morning. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and as we do, let's also prepare to come to the table uh, because um, uh, the Lord has given to us the Lord's table, remember, to show us how our Lord Jesus, as the author to the Hebrews also reminds us, resisted sin even to the point of shedding blood. You know, Jesus, he was tempted, as we are in everything, yet without sin. And um, he resisted even the, the temptation not to go to the cross. Remember how he prayed in the garden? Um, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. I mean, Jesus was a human being. He didn't relish the idea of being crucified. I don't think any of us would. But we need to remember, too, it wasn't just the crucifixion, but it was the laying of our sins on him and enduring God's wrath on the cross. He didn't relish the idea of doing that either. Edwards has a sermon where uh, he talks about, you know, the passage where Jesus is praying and he looks ahead into the fiery furnace. Jesus descends into hell on the cross. He experiences the wrath of God. And as he's praying and asking if it's possible this cup might pass, he begins uh, sweating, as it were, great drops of blood which shows that he was under a great deal of duress because of what was ahead of him. But he resisted even to the point of shedding blood. I'm not sure if it was the blood from the duress or certainly the blood of the cross in his resisting sin. Okay? That's what the table reminds us of. And Christ, our Lord Jesus, gives us grace to be strengthened in this area uh, by remembering what he has done, but by also communicating to us the help of his Holy Spirit. So let's prepare ourselves uh, to receive what he has for us this morning in just a few moments of prayer.